Well, have you ever heard the expression, usually it's given as a toast, but here's to what? M mud in your eye? Here's some mud in your eye. Um, some people think that that expression came out of World War I, where there was a lot of soldiers in trenches and they got very muddy and they were, they were toasting each other because they would have a tendency to drink a lot uh, in those times. But there's a whole nother camp that believes that expression, here's to mud in your eye, comes from a whole different place. And it comes from the story we're going to read today in John chapter 9, where Jesus healed a blind man by putting mud in his eyes. And the whole toast about here's to mud in your eye is really a, about a, a, a toast to good health. Well, obviously, the mud that Jesus put on this blind man's eyes gave him good health, didn't it? So we're going to read this story together. And how many know that Jesus was always teaching, even when he wasn't teaching? Yep. You know, I mean, Jesus taught a lot, but then there were a lot of other times that he wasn't actually teaching, and yet he was still teaching. And he claimed to be the truth. And we see this in John chapter 14, verse 6. Let's read that. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So uh, either Jesus was a really crazy lunatic to say that, or he was true in saying that. But let's, let's be honest about this. There's no in-between. It's, he's either the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come and be reconciled with God apart from him. Either that is true, or he's a liar. There's, there's no, like, middle ground on this. And sometimes people who are followers of Jesus have been criticized because of their perspective of exclusivity. Now, I believe in welcoming all people. So in that sense, there should be no exclusiveness. But it is true, based on what Jesus said, that there's only one way that our sins can be dealt with and forgiven and our shame can be dealt with and our guilt can be forgiven and gotten rid of, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. And I don't believe we as followers of Jesus should ever back down from that. Because if we back down from that, we then are basically saying, I don't really believe what you were saying here, Jesus. So if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, I just need to believe what he said. I just need to believe what he said. The people who lived with Jesus and also followed him during his lifetime on earth and who came to actually know him in a personal way, actually said that Jesus was God's word to humanity lived out in the flesh. We see that in, as John penned the scriptures, and I really like how, again, the Chosen series, when John is beginning to formulate how he wanted to write the book of John, because the book of John was written later, one of the later gospels, and uh, Jesus is obviously ascended into heaven. And it's important to John that they capture the essence of who Jesus was and is. And he begins his book, of the book of John, by saying this. John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, the word already existed. Well, in the beginning... The word already existed. But what's the word? The word was with God. Well, we know that the word was with God. And the word was God. So we know the word is also God. He existed in the beginning with God. Now he puts this word he in here. And that he, of course, is Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, the word. And he already existed. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God, and Jesus existed in the beginning with God. He was God's word to humanity, lived out in the flesh. 
So then we see in verse 14 of the same chapter, John says it this way. And these are the New Living Translation. So the word became human. Or so Jesus became human. And made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Wow. Just, you can meditate on that for a long time and just get carried away, can't you? You know? Most religious outcasts, people who were not accepted by the rank and file of the religious order of the day, most religious outcasts loved Jesus. Most of them did. And most religious leaders hated Jesus. So if you were disenfranchised or marginalized or uh, had some kind of physical uh, deformity or uh, anything that was less than perfect that would, would, would create a situation where you could be ostracized, those are the people that loved Jesus. The people that really hated Jesus were the people that felt they had it all together. And they were mostly the religious people. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why did these marginalized people love Jesus and why the religious leaders hate Jesus? Well, I really believe it's because both groups actually understood his message. They both groups understood his message. It was a message of hope to sinners and also a message that was a threat to the stewards of religion, those people who were in charge of keeping religious order. Jesus was a threat to them. And in John chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man in a most unusual and very dramatic way and in this chapter, we find a real interesting twist. We see that the blind are made to see, and those people who claim to see are actually really exposed as being really blind. So we see where Jesus heals a blind man and exposes those who think they see as really blind. And this particular story happened at the tail end of a religious holiday in, in Jerusalem. Uh, the population of Jerusalem swelled. It kind of reminds me of the little town I grew up in, northern Minnesota, Crosby, Arrington. And uh, during the week, there might be 2,500 people that live in the town. And you may not be aware of this, but Crosby was an iron mining uh, community back when we were when I was a child. And they have all of these mine dumps where all the tailings were dumped and stuff from from the mining. Well, they're, they're like little mountains, and people love to go mountain bike riding. And so on the weekends in the summer, Crosby's population can swell to 15,000 people. Now, can you imagine a town that's built for 2,500 people? You have a restaurant that seats 30 people or 40 maybe, and then you have two gas stations, and, and you have a Dairy Queen and, and a grocery store. And it, and, it, and it functions really well for 2,500 people. And then all of a sudden, for three straight days, there's 17,000 people in the community now, all wanting to buy gas, all wanting a Dairy Queen, all wanting whatever they want, right? Well, this is like Jerusalem at this time, because this uh, festival it was a festival of booths or sukkot, I'm not quite sure how to say it. People say it differently. I thought I knew how to speak Hebrew. Then I went to Israel, and our guide corrected me on all my wrong pronunciations of all the <laughs> things in the Bible. So I just, I'll let him be the expert. But, but this festival was a celebration of all the years that Israel spent in the desert and the way that God protected them. I find it interesting that the reason they were in the desert is because of their grumbling and complaining and really their sin and unbelief. And yet God was still faithful to them during that 40 years, and God instituted this festival of Sukkot to remember and celebrate how he was faithful to God, I mean, how God was faithful to them, rather, during this 40-year period. Well, this celebration or festival began to be observed on an annual basis. 
called the Feast of Booths, and people would build booths and actually live in these booths for eight days and not live in their homes. And it was a way to connect back to what their predecessors had gone through. And at the end of this festival, Jesus is teaching in the temple courts where the largest group or number of people could hear his message of hope. And the religious leaders could also hear his message of warning, because he did that. And on the last day of the festival, Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple area, and they see a man who has been blind from birth. And the fact that this man was outside the temple area, the temple grounds, is significant. And the reason it's significant is because at the time of Christ, uh, a physical disability like this man had, being blind, was often assumed to be God's punishment for some kind of sin. So this sinner would not have been welcome in the holy services or the celebrations that were taking place during this festival in spite of the fact that he was Jewish and that he was part of that Jewish religion. So the disciples apparently have bought into this idea that maladies from birth, whether it be blindness or this kind of thing, uh, they bought into the idea that these things happen because of either the, hit their sin or the sins of the parents. And so they asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? So let's read this from John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? So here's the question. They, they had bought into this idea. Some in our modern-day culture would call it karma. That's what some people would call it. But I have good news for all of you karma believers today, and that is grace is greater than karma. Grace is greater than karma. Let that sink in for a little bit. Let it just sink in. And one of the popular beliefs I said at the time of Christ is that this disease or disability from birth was attributed to the sins of the ancestors or even your own sins while you were in the womb. Now, I was talking to Jackie about this last night. I said, well, what kind of trouble can a baby in the womb get into? You know, that, that God would judge them so severely. But people believed that God was always watching and ready to punish even the smallest infraction. I wonder how much of that belief has seeped forward into churches today. Yes. So the disciples were thinking that one of two perspectives had to be true. Either this man had committed some kind of sin or his parents had committed some kind of sin. So they asked this question, whose sin brought on this man's suffering? I wonder how many people are asking that question about the Ukraine today. I wonder what sins the Ukrainian people committed that they would be brutally attacked in this manner from a warmonger. So the disciples see this blind beggar and all they can think to do is use him as a launching pad into a discussion about the origin of evil. That's all they can think about. Him. They see this beggar, he's blind, been born blind, had been blind his whole life. I think he was 38 years old. And all that the disciples can think of is to use this victim this poor man, as a launching pad to get into the discussion 
of who was responsible for the evil. And let's face it, isn't it always easier to respond to suffering with pious concern and even indignant conversation about who's responsible for evil than it is to actually do something about it? You see a homeless person suffering, and we go through all sorts of questions in our minds. Well, I wonder what he did. I wonder what irresponsible thing he's been doing. I bet you he's an alcoholic, or I bet you he's a drug addict. I bet you this, I bet you that. And we launch into a discussion on the origins of the evil or the origins of the tragedy rather than focus on what God wants us to do, and that's actually let's do something about the suffering in the world. So the disciples asked this question to Jesus, who is responsible for this man's suffering, his parents or him? And Jesus responds with these words. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus basically says, stop blaming the victim for their own suffering. Stop blaming the victim for their own suffering. And with that, he flatly rejects karma as a graceless doctrine that many people buy into. And instead, what Jesus does here is he teaches that we should see each and every situation of suffering as an opportunity to help. Every single one. Not look at what was the cause of the suffering, what, who was responsible, was there some guilt to bear upon the person who is suffering, but rather, let's just bring a love, relief to the suffering. With the same mercy we've been given. That's right. Apply that mercy to another. That's right. So Jesus teaches that we should see every situation of suffering as an opportunity to help and to see God work through us. Because right attached to this scripture, let's read it again. He says this, we must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us because the night is coming and then no one can work. And Jesus looks at this suffering as an opportunity to do the work of God. So I can just see the disciples now. They were, this wasn't their first rodeo with Jesus. You know, this was... Uh, near the end of Christ's ministry. So they'd seen him do a lot of miracles. And I can just, I, 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 they probably got accustomed to recognizing when Jesus was about to do another one. And I can just see the disciples now. Uh, they might be glancing at each other or looking at each other. Maybe if there was a few of them a, a little bit away from Jesus, Maybe they might have said, how do you think he's going to do this? Is he going to go and lay hands on him? You know, or maybe he'll do what he did with the Roman centurion. He'll just say the word. He'll just say the word. I wonder how he's going to do this. And I wonder if uh, some of them thought, I, uh, what method is he going to use that we can emulate? And so we see in verse 6 of this chapter what his method was. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Jesus stops in his tracks, bends over the dirt, and he starts to make those noises that one makes when they're trying to get a big goober up in their mouth. Well, he, he needed to have a little more than a tiny bit. <laughs> oh, 
Let me, yeah, that's it. That's it. Can, can you do it again? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know? I mean, how do you get enough spit to make a mud with, right? I mean, you got you to gotta kind of collect it there a little bit, right? <laughs> Knows what I'm talking about, right? I thought about this story, and I thought to myself, I've never seen this in a stained glass window in a church. (laughs) If you're walking down the street and you hear someone make that noise, you do a, you pivot left or right, don't you? Or you start walking a lot faster. So here's the moment in the life of Christ that really doesn't make it into many movies. Yet Jesus lays a big one down in the dirt and picks it up and starts to make a poultice, kind of. And... The disciples, I can just see what's going on in their minds. No one expects what happens next. Jesus walks, obviously, towards the blind man with his hands out in front of him. Of course, the blind man can't see what about to take place. (laughs) Good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. (laughs) And Jesus takes this mud made out of spit, and I know that religious people would want to make that into some kind of holy spit. But it was spit. And Jesus makes this concoction, this mud, and spreads it all over the man's eyes. And then he told him to do one other thing that was very interesting. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So we're left with a couple of questions here, I think. Why the mud? And why the pool? Why the mud and why the pool? For the fact of the matter is, the power that healed this man was not in the mud that was made, wasn't in this potion that Jesus created. The power that healed him was within Jesus himself. So the question we need to ask ourselves then is, well, why the dramatics? Why the mud out of spit? Why go wash in the pool? And then he received his healing. And why wash in that specific pool before the healing could take effect? So to understand the answers to those two questions, why the mud and why the pool, we have to read on just a little bit further, and we see another verse that reveals the larger thing Jesus was going after here. And we find it in verse 13 and 14. They took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. Mm, Now it comes out. It was on the Sabbath that Jesus did this. When God gave Moses the law back on Mount Sinai, it didn't take long for what was called the elders of Israel to begin to interpret the law that God gave. And they began to add different applications of the law. God said, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The elders then began to start to interpret that law. And they began to create what was called the oral traditions the oral Torah. And later on, these oral traditions 
became codified or written down. And this accumulation of all of these traditions that was written down was called the Mishnah. That's a Jewish, I, I'll call it a book, the Jewish book for the, all the oral traditions and interpretations of the law. Now, there are many laws or rules in the Mishnah about what can and cannot be done on the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, there were so many laws that had been created, or rules, rather, that had been created by the oral traditions that a person was bound up every which way from Sunday. Or maybe I should say Saturday. <laughs> it was a day to avoid all forms of work. And Jesus seems to be absolutely committed to breaking as many of these rules as possible. According to the Mishnah, attempting to heal someone with a remedy on the Sabbath is sin. That was one of the oral traditions. Unless the situation was life and death. If the ox had actually fallen on you, okay, you could pull the ox off. But chronic conditions like blindness or leprosy or a limb that was lame or what have you, paralyzed legs, deaf ears, all of that can wait a day. And anointing someone with any kind of salve or healing ointment is specifically prohibited in the Mishnah. Now, we all know Jesus could have just said, be healed. But he was after something deeper than just the healing of this man. One of the rules of the Mishnah was that you could add water to your breakfast porridge, but you couldn't mix it. Because mixing is working. Do you now understand why God said in Hosea, I hate all of this religious stuff you're doing? They took the principles of God's word, which in general terms described what it is like to be in a good relationship with somebody or a good relationship with God, and they absolutely heaved burden upon burden upon burden upon people. Jesus comes along, and this is his approach. Spit, mix, smear, wash, be healed. <laughs> and we have to understand that this is no magical formula for healing blind people. I actually wonder how many people have tried to emulate what Jesus did. Not knowing that what Jesus was after here, what the, the mud had nothing to do with the healing. Jesus was the one that healed them. The mud had everything to do about coming against the religious rules and regulations that were binding people up from having a true love relationship with Jesus Christ. It was basically an attack on religion gone amok. That's what it was. It was an attack on religion gone amok. And even the pool that Jesus sent the blind man to was a central part of a cleansing ritual that, believe it or not, on the last day of Sukkot, the high priest would take an entourage and go to this pool and gather water, and come back and do their oblations and all their ceremonial things for cleansing and even some for healing. And this blind man walks in with mud on his eyes and gets in the pool, the head of the high priest, and comes out seeing. Wow. I'd have loved to have seen that. <laughs> And Jesus violates the religious law, not only by healing on the Sabbath, by making mud 
and applying it as a healing agent and then sends the man into the center of a religious ceremony to wash off the mud in the holy water of the pool of Siloam. I love Jesus. (laughs) And this is all intentional and it's all rather confrontational. Because Jesus chose a forbidden time, Sabbath, a prohibited way, making mud or potion, to make his point, and then he sent him to a provocative place. He sent him to a place that was going to provoke outrage among the religious leaders. Do you notice how the religious leaders treated this man. They had all seen him. They had had actually not allowed him to become part of a lot of their ceremonies, especially on holy days, because he was born blind, and therefore it was because of some sin. They knew who he was, and now all of a sudden, he's seeing. And they can't figure it out. How did this happen? Who did this? Why is this being done on the Sabbath? Yada, yada, yada. They could care less about this person. And this is why God said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. Not religious leaders who can quote the law. Jesus wasn't just ignoring the religious rules of the Pharisees. Jesus was actually going after them. He was exposing them for the mockery that they were. And one of the reasons Jesus said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, is because what they were raised in by the religious leaders represented God in a way that God wasn't at all. And the church has continued to do that for 2,000 years. And so where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? Well, I think we need to examine our own oral Torah, our own religious rules. We need to examine our thoughts and our ways that might lead us into categorizing people as us versus them. I think we need to ask what ways have we made people to feel marginalized and devalued and ostracized? as a church, as a, as a person that claims to be a Christian? In what ways have we made people feel as though they don't measure up or aren't good enough? How have we done this? And you know what? It's real easy to look at a condescending Pharisee like these Pharisees were and say, how could they do that? and not see how we have done maybe the very same thing only in a different way because it's 2022. It's not AD 30. So I pray that we would see where we have become like a Pharisee. I pray that we would see where we have fallen into that same trap. We should ask ourselves the question, what does Jesus want to go after in our lives that God might say, that is not what I want? What is in our lives, how we believe or how we think, where God might say to us, that's not what I want? I want mercy. When you see a victim, 
instead of saying, well, yeah, but he did this, or he did that, or that was there. Every time we see woundedness, it's an opportunity for us to bring the grace of Jesus to that woundedness. I can hear Jesus now. I want mercy, not religious rituals. I want mercy. I want people whose hearts are like my heart. I want people whose hearts are like my heart.